a story about a young Roman Catholic boy. And this young Roman Catholic boy wanted a bicycle very, very badly. Very, very badly. I can't say very badly enough, okay? He wanted a bike bad. He told his parents that everyone had a bicycle. You ever heard that story before? Everyone has a bicycle except for me. I'm the only one without a bicycle. And so his mother sat down with him and suggested that maybe, being a Roman Catholic boy, he should write a prayer to the Holy Mother, Mary, for that bicycle. The little boy's name was Johnny, and so Johnny said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a prayer. So he began, he went to his room, and he wrote out this prayer on a piece of paper, and he had it ready to pray before he went to bed. And so he, he prayed this prayer, and this was the prayer. Mary, Mother of God, would you see that I get a bicycle? All my friends have one. Amen. It's really to the point, okay? Well, being a good Roman Catholic family, they had a little statue of Mary out there in the living area or somewhere in the house, and, and he took the prayer after he prayed it and folded it up and stuck it there by the statue of Mary. He went to bed. Woke up the next morning, went out into the living room. Well, at first he looked around his room. There was no bicycle. And then he looked out in the living room. There was no bicycle. He went to the garage. There was no, bi no bicycle anywhere. And you'd think he would be disappointed, but no, this little boy was determined. And so he said, no, I'm going to pray for it again. And so the next night, he did the same thing. He prayed the same prayer to Mother Mary for that bicycle. Next morning, he got up, and guess what? No bicycle. Well, you know, he was still trying to keep his spirits up, so he did it again the next night, and the next night, and the next night. For a whole week, he, he prayed that prayer and, and left the prayer right there by the statue of Mary. He did it a whole week. Well, after a week of this, he was getting sort of discouraged. He was thinking his prayer wasn't getting much result. So that night, after a week, he, he decided, he woke up, he didn't actually go to sleep. He laid in bed, pretending like he was sleeping, until his mom and dad went to bed, and then he got up. And he went out to where the statue of Mary was, and he wrapped the statue of Mary in a blanket and took her and put her in the back of his closet. And he left a note. He said, Jesus, if you ever want to see your mother again, I better get that bicycle tonight. <laughs> well, the scripture this morning is about Mary. I don't know if he ever got the bicycle, by the way. This morning, the scripture this morning is about Mary, and she's not being kidnapped at this point. She's being greeted by the angel Gabriel with a special announcement that would change the world. Now, through the years, artists have done all sorts of renderings of what this announcement scene might have looked like. They've given us all sorts of images of the announcement scene. They've, they've, they've done different colors and different styles from time to time in history, the period of history. Yet Mary is always seen as this beautiful feminine object. Femininity is expressed all over her. And she's dressed usually in yards and yards of silk. Sometimes her hair is golden with a crown on her head. Even her fingernails are perfectly manicured if you look closely at the pictures. She's the perfect person. Uh, hard to believe that she's so perfect, and yet it's so hard to believe that she's just a girl. Let's remember that. She's a teenage girl. She's a teenage girl who has very little experience with men, certainly not much experience with angels, and not much experience with the world. And many times in these depictions, she's either spinning at a, at a spinning yarn or thread, or she's reading a book, a prayer book, perhaps at a prayer desk. She's absorbed in her work so many times, and suddenly out of nowhere, there's this magnificent angel appears, an angel that appears to be beautiful, as beautiful as Mary herself is, if not more beautiful. And the angel usually looks like a, a, a papal emissary, if you will crown on his head oftentimes, but sometimes in some depictions he's got a garland of flowers with, uh, a bouquet of flowers with, with flames flying out of it. Most pictures his wings are white, 
But in some pictures, his wings are peacock feathers in some medieval paintings. And he's got stuff in his hands so many times. Sometimes Gabriel has in his hands a, a lily or an olive branch or a scepter. And what do those symbolize? Well, if he has a lily, it's for purity. If he has an olive branch, you know what that's for. That's for peace. If he has the scepter, that is for authority or the kingship or lordship. But somewhere in the scene, there's almost always a dove that reminds us of what happened, what was happening there in Mary's life, was under the authority of the Holy Spirit, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But in these scenes so often, everything seems to depend upon Mary. Mary seems to have control, if you will, of the eternal presence of God. Gabriel, the angel, in some of the pictures, isn't even standing. He's sort of kneeling before her. You may have seen those. He's kneeling there right in front of Mary, And it appears that Gabriel and God and all of creation, for that matter, are waiting and depending on Mary's answer. But as you heard in the Scripture that Jennifer read just a few moments ago, Mary never got a chance to answer, did she? She didn't. She never got a chance to answer. You know, the angel didn't ask her, hey, Mary, what do you think about the idea that you become mother of God? Didn't ask for that opinion. No. The angel told her, you have found favor with God. Congratulations, Mary. You found favor with God. That's what the angel said. You have found favor with God. And then he told her that she was going to bear a son, and the son would be, sit on the same throne as King David did, so he'd be king of Israel forever, the Messiah. The angel didn't ask her how that all sounded. How's that sound to you, Mary? He didn't ask that question. The angel didn't, uh, didn't, say, uh, uh, didn't ask her if she'd like to just try this role out. For, would you like to try it out for a little while and see how it goes? No. The angel didn't get real psychological with her and say, how do you feel about this, Mary? Didn't do that. No, the angel told her, you have found favor with God. You found favor with God. And the author of Luke says this after all that. He says, Mary was perplexed. Does that surprise anyone in the room? If an angel came and told you that, wouldn't you be a little perplexed? I mean, I'd be a little more than perplexed, okay? She was perplexed. She had a right to be perplexed. After all, she knew the Bible. She knew the Bible. She she knew the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and she remembered how Eve had been misled by this equally strange creature that came to her. She didn't want to make the same mistake. Perhaps that's why she interrupted the angel by asking this one question. How can this be? How in the world can this be, Gabriel? How can this be? How can this be? That's the only question she asked. You know, if it had been you or me, we'd ask a whole lot more questions, I'm sure. But see, Mary just wanted to know exactly whose idea this whole thing was. She wanted to know exactly what was going to happen to her. How was this going to occur? She wanted to make sense out of what was not going to make sense. Out of something that made no sense, she wanted to make sense of that. The idea that God wanted to surrender to flesh and blood. The idea that that, that God needed her help her help to make this plan work. How can this be, God? How can it be? You know, I think about today, if that had happened in our culture today. What question would have you asked? 
What question might have I asked? I'd ask a lot of questions, okay, because I ask a lot of questions. A lot of questions. I mean, you know, you'd want to know things like, hey, is Joseph going to stick around? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? In our day and time, anyway. What will my parents, will they still love me? What will my friends think of me? Will I get drugged into town and stoned to death for sleeping around? And when the child is king of Israel, when this child that I'm going to have becomes king of Israel, what will happen to me? Where will I be? If any of those questions came to Mary's mind, the biblical record says she didn't speak them. She didn't ask the questions. However, she still had a choice. She still had a choice. She simply chose, though, instead to listen to this angel, this angel who gave the vaguest details possible about what was going to pass. It was going to happen. That seemed clear. That wasn't Mary's choice at this point. She had a choice, though, as to say yes or no. As she had a choice about how to handle the situation she found herself in. She could, she could either take no, hold of this unknown life that was now being placed before her. She could humble herself and let go of her plans and her ideas. Or she could say no. No. She could defend herself against that plan. However, whatever must strength she could muster up, she could claim her will and her desire came first and push all that aside. She could try to do that. And her response, her response are those words, here am I, the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord, let it be with me according to to your word. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. If you ever want to know where the Beatles got the idea for their song, Mother Mary came to me speaking words of wisdom. Let it be, let it be. This is it. It wasn't an original thought. It came from Mary in her conversation with Gabriel. Let it be with me according to your word. And when she said those words, when she said that to Gabriel and said that to God, she was filled with peace. Because the next chapter, which we'll roll into this evening, by the way, is chapter 2. We roll right into the birth of the Messiah. That's the end of the dialogue. Mary is the only one in the history of the world to ever have to make that decision, to ever decide how she was going to respond to this, to finding favor with the Lord in this way. The Eastern Church knows Mary as Theotokos, Theotokos, which is the God-bearer. She was the God-bearer. Mary was the one who chose to humble herself and to carry this child and to give birth to this child and to nurse this child and to raise the very Son of God. She made that choice. Mary was the only person ever drafted to do that. However, when we hear the story, we hear a little of our own story in it. Our story may be found in the choices that we face every day, there's a great deal of talk in our world today about choices which we have to make. The talk goes further to tell us that it, it's up to each of us to choose our own lives. Ever heard that one? It's up to you and me to choose our own lives. However, more often than not, our lives actually choose us. Think about that. More often than we choose our lives, our lives choose us. You know, I don't know if you ever tried this. You ever tried to lay out a 10-year plan for your life? Ever try that? Don't waste your time, okay? I just blew someone's whole career probably right there. 
But anyway, if you ever try to lay out a 10-year plan of your life, guess what's going to happen? Well, something's going to happen along the way. I mean, there's going to be a sudden illness of some sort that you didn't plan for in those 10 years. There may be a surprise baby. You may be another Mary story. I don't know. You, you know or maybe you get aging parents come along and something you need to take care of them. Or, or there's an economic change in your life. You get downsized or whatever happens. Or, or there's a family crisis or family circumstances that, that cause you to shift your plan. And, you know, and some of those things seem really terrible when they happen, and some of those things seem wonderful when they happen. But seldom, very seldom, do we know ahead of time what's going to happen in our lives. Like Mary, our choice boils down to a yes or no. We can either respond, yes, I will live the life that's being handed to me, though it may not be my plan, Though it may not be my desire, we can humble ourselves and trust in God. Or we can say, no, I will not live the life being held out to me. I'm going to take it back and control it and do it my own way. We can respond, yes, I'll explore the unexpected turn of events. Or no, I will not explore these turn of events at all. And if we decide to say no, if we say no when those events come our way, we can simply duck our heads. We can duck our heads and, and keep our heads ducked for a long time because we've got to wait for the angel to leave the room, okay? And the angel can hang around for a long time because he's an eternal being. And then we can smooth our head back and we can turn to our spinning or our reading or whatever else we do. And we can pretend that nothing's happened. But what we find when we make that choice is we're not at peace. We're not at peace anymore, are we? We don't find peace in that choice. We have chosen to be outside of trusting and having faith in the will and power and love of God and seeking our own desire instead. But sometimes even when we make that choice, our life just changes anyway, doesn't it? It changes anyway, and then we have even more options. First of all, we can just be stoic. Just be stoic. Just shut off all emotion, all feeling. Just be stoic about it. Secondly, we can choose to refuse to accept the whole thing. Just refuse it. Third, we can put our energy into ignoring it. Insist, in spite of the evidence, that nothing's going to happen to you. But if you choose this route, you will not find peace in having it your way. If these do not work for you, you still have more options. You can become angry. There's a lot of angry people in this world. Defend yourself against the unknown, trying to get your life back to the way it used to be. You can become very angry. Individually, you can become angry. Churches become very angry. They look back and say, well, look what it was 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Or you look at your life and say, look where I was when I was in my 20s. Oh, I don't want to look at that, by the way. But anyway. But you never move forward because you're unwilling to step into the unknown and trust in God if you don't let go of that. Another option is you can become bitter. You can compare your lot in life to everyone else's life that seems more agreeable than yours. And you can lament your unhappy fate. If you succeed at any of these, your life will not be an easy one. Because most likely you're fighting against the Lord's desire and your faith in God. And you're not going to find peace here. The other option is to do this. To look at the circumstances that have been placed before you, the life that's been placed before you, and say, yes, I'll go forward with God. And then you can say the words that Mary said. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Say those with me. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then you can decide to be a servant 
In doing that, you decide to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. In doing that, you find a peace that even in the midst of the chaos, even in the midst of the unplanned agenda before you, you find a peace that passes all understanding. You can decide to take part in the plan you did not choose, doing a thing that you don't fully understand, doing a thing that perhaps you don't even know exactly how you're going to do it. And you do that by simply trusting in God and saying those words again. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let be with me according to your word. You can take part in a thrilling and dangerous scheme that way. A scheme that, that has no human script. A theme that has absolutely no human guarantee to it. But you can choose to say yes to that. You can agree to, to smuggle God into the world through your body, through your actions, through your words, through who you are. You can choose to agree to that. And when you decide to say yes, it doesn't mean you're not going to be afraid because you will be afraid, by golly. If it's something of God, it'll be big. And you'll be afraid. You will be afraid. It means that you're going to be willing, though, to, to keep your fears, not let your fears keep you locked in a room. You see, you say yes to the angel. You say yes to that angel, and your yes goes like, what? Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And when you say that, you become one of Mary's people. Become one of those Theotokos who are willing to bear God into all the world. You see, in a strange way, every one of us, when we say those words, are choosing to be a mother to God. That's right. I mean, what good is it for any of us if you had this beautiful eternal birth and the, of the divine Son, if all that takes place in the world but doesn't take place in your heart? What good is that? What good is it for me, to, for me if Mary is full of grace and full of wonder and I'm not full of that same grace and wonder? What good is that? And what good is it to me if the Creator gave birth to his son, if I don't give birth to that same son in this time, and this place, in this world, what good is that? Stand with me. The Holy Spirit give us, gives us peace. The same peace that Mary had and so as we enter into this Christmas Eve, I invite you, I invite you to recommit your lives in the same way that Mary committed her life, that first appearance of Gabriel. Say it with me. Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. You see, this is the fullness of time when the Son of God is begotten to each and every one of us. Greetings, favored ones. The Lord God Almighty is with each of you. Do not be afraid, for nothing, nothing is impossible with God. So go forth and bear the Son of God into all the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.